continue after homecoming the series I was doing on the church. Uh, we've been dealing with the questions that Peter sort of presents in uh, the form of this scripture. And in chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, excuse me, through verse 13 through 313, he actually is dealing with, uh, again, uh, the question of submission. If you'll notice, I know on the screen, I titled name is Miss. We are to be. We are to be. He's already talked about formal obligations uh, for, uh, in the in the first part of this uh, outline. Uh, he talked about the formal obligation that we have to submit to those in authority, uh, whatever the case may be, whether it be government, so on and so forth. And then he comes back and he talks about family obligations in chapter 3. We looked at Wednesday night and he talked about the husband and the wives. Uh, and Paul was more in depth and he uh, disclosed to us the, the unity of subjection. Uh, we're subject one another in the fear of God, husband and wife. Uh, but it seems that uh, somebody said, well, why did uh, Peter write so much about the wives and didn't mention the men so much? You need to understand that women were very uh, subjected. They were a lower rank. Uh, they were only allowed to do certain things. Uh, and uh, in the economy in which they lived, there was they had a, a very rigorous lifestyle. They were more slaves than they were uh, uh, that of a unity with a husband. And we need to understand that when you read the background of this. Uh, but on the other hand, he's using that relationship to show us that it's not the outward beauty that makes the difference. It's the, it's the inward, uh, the hidden man of the heart. Uh, and he talked about the godly woman there. Uh, and he went back and poured out a, a text of, in the Old Testament we used this morning uh, of that of Sarah, how she obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, uh, because she had that much respect for him because she knew that he was subjective to God. And as long as he was subjective to God, she had no, <coughs> no problem ranking under him and letting him take the lead role in the home and the family. Uh, so that's pretty much where we're at. And he, he comes back in verse 7 and he challenges the husbands and he gives a challenge there to them in verse 7. And he says, listen, you, you need to make sure that you uh, love your wife, respect your wife, uh, and live with them according to knowledge, to give honor to the wife as the weaker vessel as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So there's some things that can hinder the prayers of a couple if, if the relationship and the fellowship is not right. And he's talking about submission, okay? Keep that in mind. Now, a lot of them had a real problem because Nero was a very, very ungodly man, Okay? And everywhere you look and look at the history of Nero, he persecuted the church. Uh, he didn't like Peter. He didn't like believers. And he did every, everything he could to annihilate them and to ruin the movement of Christianity. And if you ever want to do a study on him, he's a very interesting individual uh, and caused great havoc to the church. So we've gone from formal obligations to family obligations in this area of submission. And now we're going to go to fellowship obligations. Uh, as we read verse 8 and following, down through verse 13, he says, finally. <laughs> uh, it's almost as if he's wanting to get done with this, okay? So finally, be all of one mind. It's almost like saying, I've got a closing comment I need to make. Uh, if you had not had enough already, here comes some more. Having compassion one of another, love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. But contrariwise, blessing, knowing that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensure it, ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and the ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And notice the question he asked in verse 13. He, he said, and who is he that will harm you? If you be followers of that which is good. But, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. 
pray with me. Father, thank you again uh, for the ability and the freedom to read the Word of God. And Lord, I've read in the hearing of your people, Lord, tonight, the infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of God. And Lord, I pray now that you'd help me and give me the ability and the illumination, Lord, to uh, un unwrap this Scripture, Lord, and, and allow it to speak to our hearts individually and collectively, Lord. Move within us, Lord, and among us that we might be obedient when the invitation time comes, uh, that we'll learn to be submissive, Lord, to your will and, and to your way for our lives. Lord, I pray again, uh, knowing that your word is authority, and Lord, and I pray that we would yield to that tonight, Father, it's been preached. In Jesus' name, amen. The question of submission. We are to be uh, in this thing of, uh, of uh, fellowship obligations. We need to realize when we belong to the body of Christ, or we might say the family of God or the church, there are some obligations of fellowship. First of all, there's some requirements of fellowship. Number one, we've got to be saved. We've got to be born again. And we have to have the Holy Spirit living and, and dwelling in us. And we have to have a, a, uh, a exchange. There has to be an exchange of the old life to the new life. There has to be a yielding to Christ. And therefore, as a result of that, that's what makes us a part of the family of God. That's what we mean when we talk about fellowship. Kianoia in 1 John is a powerful word. It's a fellowship like no other organization uh, any civic group has. It, it's, it's a family organization. It's a family, it's a fellowship organization that has obligations he says finally finally be ye all of one mind so as you look at verse 8 and verse 9 the first thing we see here in these two texts is uh, two verses of scriptures we look at this these fellowship obligations we're to be submissive in conduct okay that's what he's saying first of all we're to be submissive in conduct he says be ye all of one mind now folks he's not talking about communism okay but he is talking about unison He's talking about unity and unison. Be ye all of one mind. Okay? You know what happens when you got two heads? You got a freak, don't you? Okay? There's one head. It's Jesus Christ. It's not me. It's not you. Uh, it's Jesus. He's the head of the church. And he is the mind of the church. That's why we need to be indwelled and filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why we've got the Word of God. So we can know the mind of God. Why? Because in our own weakness and our own flesh, even though we've been saved, listen, we can't, we can't uh, obtain all the things he has for us and the direction he wants for us if we're not in relationship and fellowship with him and his Word and among one another. We're to, as we look at this thing of being submissive in conduct, he really says several things here, about five or six things in the heart of this scripture about being submissive in our conduct. First of all, in verse 8, uh, the first thing he shows us is that we're to be compatible. We're to be compatible. And when he uses that be of all one mind, uh, it's the word uh, homophron. Uh, in, in the Greek, it's a word that means we should agree. Uh, there again, we should be in agreement, all of one mind, in agreement, just like we've had the business meeting. We agree, agree on the financial statement. We agree on what we're doing and the direction we're going. And we try to pray and be in unison. And we try to agree with what God wants to do, uh, what God is doing, what God wants to do in the family of God. So we need to make sure, as we understand this, finally, we're to be of one mind. We're to be submissive in conduct. You know, we got a question here. We got a, we got a problem. The question comes up, well, what about when somebody doesn't believe what you necessarily believe? Well, there are really basic, five basic doctrines you have to believe to have fellowship and to have this uh, uh, obligation to one another. And when doctrine is concerned or where doctrine is concerned and where issues widely differ in belief, Going separate ways might be the best solution, okay? Uh, you try to have a uh, unity the best you can. Uh, you, you try to be compatible as much as you can. But you, when you begin to study different things, there's di people uh, I, we can be compatible with. But listen, when they deny the deity of Jesus Christ, when they deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, when they, when they deny, uh, listen, the, the sinless perfection of Jesus Christ, when they deny the fact that we can be filled and dwell with the Holy Spirit, uh, and we can go on and on with those basic doctrines, when people begin to deny that, we, need to, we, we get to a point and we have to make a decision. Can we have fellowship or can't we have fellowship? You see, one of the things we have to do in this culture is we have to do that. And I understand we've got this idea, well, there'll be no titles. There'll be no denominations. I hear that all the time. Well, that is true. But there's some things that we're required to believe, folks. There's, and we've got this idea today that doctrine doesn't matter. 
Listen, that's not the Word of God. The whole Bible is doctrine. You can't escape doctrine. And you be very careful of anybody that tells you they want to do a Bible study in their home or, or at, over at work. They're, they're, not, they're not going to discuss any particular doctrine. You don't know what that's leading to? That's leading to something very dangerous. Because the whole Bible is doctrine. We ought to know what we believe. We ought to be, Paul said that we're to rightly divide the word of truth. We're to search this word to come to truth and conclusion. And we're, we're to settle on that. That doesn't mean that we're to be obnoxious or to be rude or any of those things or think that we have some type of hierarchy among others. But look, folks, there's some doctrines that are taught in the Bible that we cannot abuse and we cannot ignore. They're very important. But we're to be compatible as much as we can. You remember back in Genesis chapter 13, uh, in verse uh, 7 through verse 9, uh, the Bible says, And there was a strife between the herd. Well, let me go back to verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram and had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. All right? We're not talking about doctrine. We're talking about a difference in, in, in direction. Okay, There are two different directions here. Lots, lots wanting to settle down in Sodom. Lots wanting to live like Sodom. Abraham was wanting to stay close and clean to God. And, let, and, and there's a strife between them of the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the, here it is. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. There's the problem. Abram knows that he serves the one, the true, and the living God. And he can't get mixed up with the Canaanites and the Perizzites because they're worshipers of idols. But Lot, uh, the, the unspiritual man that he is, uh, wants that land that neighboring them. Verse 8 says, And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife. There it is, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, notice, he says, if you'll take the left hand, he says, I'll go to the right, and if thou depart to the right hand, I'll go to the left. And we know the decision Lot made. Lot saw the plains of Jordan, and he went down to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he reaped the consequences. You see, Abraham and Lot came to a place where they weren't compatible. There was a contention between the herdsmen of both men, and Lot had his eyes on, on Sodom and all the, the plains that were so pleasant and beautiful to look upon. And Abraham waits on God. And he waits. And he wants to be obedient to the voice of God. And therefore we find that he comes to a place where there's not compatibility. Well, if we're going to be submissive in conduct, there, we have to be compatible. We have to be compatible. He's already shown us with our husbands and wives. There has to be compatibility in the church. We have to be compatible. We have to work together as much as we can. Every one of us in here are different. We have different likes. We have different dislikes. But the one thing that makes us alike that we ought to focus on is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Amen? That's what makes us alike. Uh, that's what puts us in fellowship. No, 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 notice secondly, as we're, as we're to be submissive in conduct, he says we're to be compatible there in verse 8. Uh, as he speak, be ye of all of one mind. And then he says, having compassion one of another. Uh, we're to be compassionate. Uh, that word, word compassionate is the word sympatheo. It's the word where we get our word sympathy from or sympathetic. Uh, or really the root is sympathy. It carries the idea of suffering for someone. It's talking about a deep love. Uh, it's not talking about something that's pretense. Having compassion one of another. It's talking about the idea of suffering for someone. You're willing to do without for somebody. You're willing to die for somebody. You're willing to take second place so that they'll stand on the platform. You know, the idea here is that our hearts are to go out to other believers the idea here is that we ought to rejoice. We ought to rejoice when they rejoice and we ought to weep when they weep. We ought to be so, so linked together as the body of Christ and have the same mind. We are, our compatibility ought to bring us to have compassion one another. 
Listen, if somebody else is going through a financial difficulty, uh, we, we, we pray for them and we long for them. We've been there. Uh, we've been through financial uh, difficulty. Therefore, we know how to pray with them. Uh, we can help them. We can encourage them. Uh, we, we take a loss of a child or, or, or a family member. What a great time to minister. That's a time, no other time we can show compassion. Uh, and by the way, thanks for the cards and the things we got this week celebrating our anniversary. It's a blessing to open those up and look at some of the words and the things that are said. And, and just simple things like that. What a blessing it is. One of the greatest ways we show compassion is we have a death here. And people bring food and they labor and, and they go beyond the means to make sure that that family doesn't have to labor. And through this difficult time, they don't have to worry about getting a meal or running over to McDonald's. They have food right there at their home and they can focus on what they need to do and they can fellowship. You may think that's very unimportant, but it's very, listen, it's crucial. You see, that's the way of ministry. That's one of the ways this church shows that we're compassionate, that we do care. Folks, do you realize today, as you sit here tonight in this building, the churches that have quit doing that? Number one, maybe due to size, uh, structure. I, I can't tell you the reasoning behind that, but a lot of it, of it is, is most folks just go to church and, and that's it. You, you do the best you can and make it the best way you can. Folks, that's just not church. We're to be compassionate. He says in verse 8, he says, having compassion one of another. Look what he says, and then, then he says we're to be caring. He says love as brethren. Love as brethren. In other words, brothers and sisters in Christ. Folks, listen, we need to realize listen, we're linked to one another. Whether you like it or not, you're linked to me. And whether I like it or not, you, I'm linked to you if you say you're saved. If you've been born again and blood washed, listen, you're my brother in Christ. You're my sister in Christ. And folks, one of the greatest things we've done today is we've dropped that respect of a relationship and fellowship in God's house. We're to be caring. Love is brethren. We ought to, first of all, we ought to love our brothers and sisters in our immediate family. And we ought to love our children. We ought to love, our, love those who are in our families, our uncles, our aunts, our grandmothers, grandfather. It starts at home, but then it moves over. But there's something different about loving his brethren. And you may not realize it, but a lot of preachers are closer to some of their people than they are their family. Love his brethren. I'm reminded of John 21 when Peter and Jesus. And by the way, one why Peter wrote this. Well, let me just give you a little nugget. And back in John's Gospel, chapter 21, uh, you may remember this event. Uh, it says that uh, the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was risen from the dead, and when they had died, the verse 15 says, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. And he saith unto him, Feed my lambs. And he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said to him, yeah, yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said to him, feed my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Now, if you'll notice the third time, if you study the Greek, he uses a different word for love in the last question that he asked him. Why? Because Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord... Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest, uh, whether thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee. He says, Okay, Peter, guess what? We're going to see how real your love really is. And you know the story of Peter. Peter was crucified upside down for the sake of identity with Jesus Christ. And the conversation goes on, and it says, This he spake, signifying by what death he should glorify God, as I've already told you, verse 19. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. <laughs> follow me. Peter said, he said, Listen, your greatest responsibility is to follow me. It's not to worry about John and what all of the others are doing. As you read the rest of the context of the scripture, uh, uh, there's a little contention going on here, and there's a little jealousy. And Peter comes to realize, and Jesus awakens him and shows him, and he says to him in verse 20, 22, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. He says, listen, your number one desire is not to worry about what John's doing or Andrew's doing or anybody else is doing. Your responsibility is to love me, to have fellowship with me, to love me, and also to love your brethren. He says, John, Peter, you're not in a competition 
You're not in a competition of who can sit beside me. You're to be a servant. We're to be caring. And there's no more time that we're like Jesus than when we're serving others. Love as brethren. We're to be caring in this submiss- as we're to be submissive in conduct. Again, we're to be compatible. We're to be compassionate. We're to be caring. And then he says we're to be uh, comforting. Look what he says in verse 8. There again. He says love as brethren. He said be pitiful. Be pitiful. Now, that doesn't mean, and most of we get the word pitiful there, uh, it doesn't mean you walk around with your face down and gloom like you're just broken hearted and, and you're just a pitiful person. You, you're, just, you're just a loser. You're just down on your luck. You're down on God. You're down on everything. You're just pitiful. No? And we've used that term to sometimes when people fail and we say, man, you're, you're pitiful. You can do better. So we can use that word in different forms, but that's not the word it means here. This word pitiful actually is the same word we get of being tender hearted. Tender hearted. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, he says to be ye kind and be ye tender hearted. There again, he's talking to a, the believer. To be full of pity. Folks, listen, this pagan world has influenced us as people of God to be cold, to be calloused, and to be cruel. Folks, that's not Christ like. It's just not God. Uh, there's enough of that going around. And, and the Roman world, listen, think about it for just a moment. As Peter's writing here, uh, under, this, uh, the, uh, in, under the pressures of Nero and, and those in uh, the oppressions of the Roman government, uh, the Roman world, they wouldn't have the Pregnancy Resource Center. Uh, they wouldn't have hospice. <laughs> Uh, they wouldn't have nursing homes to put the elderly. They wouldn't have AA meetings. Uh, they wouldn't have Hope After Dope, which is a place up in the mountains of North Carolina that helps addicts recover from being hooked on heroin and other drugs. Hope After Dope. There'd be no battered wives' shelters there uh, in, in, uh, in that area. There'd be no orphanages, no charities, no mission programs. So what's he telling us? And he says, listen, we're to be pitiful. We're to be the ones that are tenderhearted. And yet, even though today we have organizations, listen, they should never take the priority of our responsibility as the church. I just got a statement today, a receipt, uh, where we send the, the, our annual uh, donation in the Pregnancy Resource Center, Baptist Children's Home, and all the other entities in different places that this church supports. And folks, those are places where we have to be, we need to be tenderhearted toward those things and toward those ministries because if the church doesn't do it, some of those ministries are going to fall through the cracks. Well, notice in verse 8 also, he says we're to be of one mind, have a compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Be courteous. In other words, it means to be friendly. Or more exactly, it means to display friendly thoughtfulness for others. Boy, you know, it's such a blessing when you know somebody's thinking about you. Uh, it really is to say, hey, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to pay for that meal. Uh, and, and, or I'd like to take you out. Or I'd like to do this. Or I'd like to do that. It, it just shows thoughtfulness. and Whatever it may be. Uh, just, there's so many ways of showing thoughtfulness. Maybe a card, it may be a phone call, maybe a pat on the back, it may be some t- you don't know who needs encouraging, and God's going to put people in your path so that you can just be courteous. Folks, there, there's room for a, uh, there's no room for a Christian to be rude to others. I'll give you an example. I, I just thought about this message as I was touching up some things. Uh, most of you know that we went to the mountains and we went decided we'd ride a, we, we went and somehow another GPS gave us the wrong address. And uh, we were up at the top of the mountain. And most of you have been going from uh, Maggie Valley to Cherokee. Know that up there there's this big eight, six-story or eight-story tower. And uh, right there near it, below it, is a store. And a lot of the stores are shut down. But I said, hey, there's a store. It was 3, 3, 3 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I whip in there. I said, Renee said, well, we're going to get some directions. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. It's not taking us where we're supposed to go. Well, I whip in, go in the door. I try to be nice, and uh, the first thing I do when I open the door, we're closing, I'm closing right now. And I said, oh, this ain't going to be fun. And I said, uh, we think we might have the wrong address. There's, a, there's numbers out there at the road on that sign. I thought, thank you, sir, in the name of Jesus, have a good day. You think I'd buy anything from that bird? Listen, I drive by there 500 times. It was hard. It was hard to be nice to that guy. It was hard, but I was courteous. I was friendly. I tried to be friendly as a good one who went in, and he'd already made up his mind that he didn't want to be friendly. I'll go ahead and tell you, there's some folks you're going to meet that don't want to be friendly. Amen. 
you know what you do? You just do what you know you're supposed to do and go on. So I walked out the door, got in my car, and we went back down the mountain. Amen. So, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy, uh, I wouldn't buy too much from him. I'll be honest with you. And I wouldn't recommend you go back to him. All right. So anyhow, but our world's filled with that, folks. Everywhere. How in the world are you going to run a business? How in the world do you expect to reach the public and sell your product if you're going to treat people like trash? Uh, and, and talk down on people and, and rude and obnoxious. It's, it's just not going to work. Then he says, lastly, in verse 9, uh, we're to be uh, conciliatory. Look at verse 9. He says, not rendering evil for evil. In other words, he says, evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, but in a, being contrary, uh, but contrarywise blessing. Totally opposite of what he, you're seeing done here. You, there needs to be blessing. There needs to be a difference. In other words, he's describing here no retaliation. Now, I'll be honest with you. In my mind and in, uh, in my heart and the flesh jumped up and said, slam that door and go down the mountain. You've been there? Say amen. You're human just like I am. I want to... I really wanted to give him a little bit of my mind, but I didn't. I said, okay, I'll just bebop on down the mountain. We'll find our way, and we did. Didn't need him to start with, amen? GPS come through. We had the wrong address written down, all right? So, he didn't know that. But what's he saying? No retaliation. Somebody said this. says, you've got to be a blessing to get a blessing, and I think that's true. You see, the thing about the Bible is when you study the Bible and you study some of the study line on line, verse by verse, it's going to bring things out you're not comfortable with. <laughs> it's going to be things sometimes when you're going to preach. You, want to, you, you have to get under your desk on your knees and your face before God before you can ever say anything to anybody else. It's not easy. Some of you who teach know what I'm speaking about. No retaliation. We live in a retaliating world, and it's not, not easy to, to, to avoid that. Not rendering evil for evil. For What does it accomplish? It more or less, most of the time, it gets you in more trouble than it did the person that did the evil to start with. Or railing for railing. In other words, he's saying don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. Pray for them. Be nice to them as you can in the name of Jesus. He says, knowing the, no, no, why does he say do this? There's the root, what we want to look at in verse 9. He says, knowing that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. You see, you're the one that's going to get the blessing in these situations. You're going to get the blessing when you don't show retaliation. God's going to bless you, and that person's going to lose out on what he could have had. He's going to forfeit it, or she's going to forfeit the blessing that God had intended for you. Number one. Secondly, we're to be sanctified in conversation. We're to be sanctified in conversation, submissive in conduct, sanctified in conversation. Verse 10, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. You know what he's doing here? Every research I can come up with, is he's using a quotation from David actually uh, as a narrative here in Psalm 34. One of my favorite, uh, favorite texts. Uh, if you remember, he, he, David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And as you go back to Psalm 34, uh, verse 1 through verse 3, uh, Jamie's going to put the rest of it up there. My mind's scattered here. My soul shall make her boast of the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. And in verse 3, he says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. So in those first three verses, what he says is he's speaking here of being sanctified in conversation, in our, in our speech, in our lifestyle. Uh, he said, listen, we need courage. We need courage to live a life of praise. Now, if you remember why David's using this, Peter's borrowing this from David. David got himself in a mess when he was in prison down by, by Abimelech, uh, and he pretends to be a lunatic, phones at the mouth, uh, and he's, uh, is, he's incarcerated, and he, he says, hey, i got to get rid of this madman, and he lets him loose, and now he's on the hillside of Judea when he sin, uh, pins down Psalm 34, and he's looking back at the mess God got him out of, and he realizes that there's some things he said that got those guys in trouble that were following him. He had let his mouth and his conduct and his uh, braggart attitude get those guys in some controversy. 
And now they had to escape, and now they're here in this hillside. He said we need courage to offer up praise. And then in Psalm 34, he also mentions the fact we need courage to own our problem. Jamie, pull up verse 4 and 5 if you can there in Psalm 34. Look what he says in verse 4 and 5. He said, I sought the Lord and he heard me. And he delivered me, here it is, from all my fears. That tells us exactly where he was at. They looked in him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. Uh, and he goes on to say in those verses, what he's saying here is, listen, they have no idea the trouble that they were really in. They don't realize the threat that they were in. And David says, it was my mouth. <laughs> it was my mouth, my, my life and my mouth and my conversation that have got them in the mess they're in. Well, go on with me. We're to be sanctified in conversation is what he's saying there in verse 10. He says, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they should speak no guile. He had gotten himself and his counterparts in deep trouble because he spoke and he, and he should have refrained his tongue from saying some things he said and now he's jeopardized their lives. Then verse 11. In verse 11, we're to be sanctified in conversation. And then lastly, we're to be saintly in character. Saintly in character. Look at verse 11. He said, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek, seek peace and ensue it. What's he saying here? In other words, he's encouraging us to take the right path. Peter knew what it was to take the wrong path. Uh, he, he, he looked back at his journey and he, he, he bragged about the rooster crowing. Listen, uh, the, uh, he bragged about not denying the Lord. He, he had a little bit of fire barrel chat. And all in all, you go with the different scenarios in his life. And he was so, so uh, rambunctious in a lot of ways. But he's learned now to take the right path. Secondly, as we talk about the, being saintly in character, we have to take the right path. We have to eschew evils, avoid, stay away from all the evil we can and do good. And we've got to seek peace and we've got to pursue it. That word ensue means to pursue. We've got to look for it. We, can't, we, can't, we, we have to look for it. We have to desire it. We have to work for it and work on it in, in, the, in our lives, in our families, our homes, in our church. It doesn't come natural. And look at verse 12. We must take the right path, but he says we ought to tell God to keep the right perspective. He says, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Folks, there's a lot of folks today, you say, well, how in the world are they getting by? I'm trying to live, I'm trying to tithe, I'm trying to live for God, trying to grow and develop and be what God wants me to be as a man or woman of God. Why, why, it just seems like every time I take two steps forward, I get slapped back three or four. Why, why, what do, folks, let me remind you, you're in a battle. The battle's not over. The victory's not won. Listen, we're, still, we're in a battle with this flesh and this world of the devil. But we've got to keep the right perspective. That's what Peter said. He says, why? Because the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. He's going to take care of us. No, everything's not going to work out perfect. Yes, there's going to be some difficult times. There's going to be some down times. There's going to be some times. But we need to understand that his ears are open unto our prayers. Thank God we have somebody to call on when the bottom drops out in our life. Amen. We've got somebody to lean on. We've got somebody to tell our difficulties and our problems. We can take it to the throne of grace. But in, but in the other place, those who don't know God... The face of the Lord is against them that are working evil and doing good. You see, they think they're winning, and they think they're going to achieve, and they think they're going to make it. But one day, ladies and gentlemen, there's going to be a judgment. And judgment, where every single person is going to stand before God, saved and lost. And it's going to be then when we can look back and we can say it was worth it after all. It was worth it after all. Look at verse 13. We're to take the right path. We're to keep the right perspective. But he says we're to keep the right policy. Look what he says. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that way? Which is good. Verse 13. He's asking a question there, okay? He's making a general statement right here over all the, <clears throat> over all the persons who, who, who follow uh, this path he's speaking of that will experience good. He said, but if... And if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. and Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of a reason of hope. You know, there's a lot of folks today who want to know what to do. 
there's a lot of folks around you who don't have any hope. And we have the answer, folks. We have the answer, and it's still Jesus Christ. It's still Jesus Christ. And it's through our saintly character that we'll have the opportunity to explain to them and display to them the answer is Jesus. He goes on to say this, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you, accuse your good conversation in Christ. Well, and he goes on to say some other things in the remaining part of the chapter. I read this. He's making again a general statement here over all the persons uh, or per people who will follow the path that will experience good when it's all said and done. I'm reminded of this thing uh, about character, uh, and that's what he's dealing with here in a nutshell. He, he's talking about Christian character. He's talking about being submissive, and there's submissive, submissiveness involved in Christian character. I read this. It said Will Rogers was known for his laughter, but he also knew how to weep. One day he was entertaining... A, the Milton H. Berry Institute in Los Angeles. It was a hospital for uh, specializing and rehabilitating polio victims and people with broken backs and other extreme physical handicaps. Of course, Rogers had everybody laughing, even patients in really bad condition, but when he suddenly left the platform and went to the restroom, Milton Berry followed him to give him a towel. And when he opened the door, he saw Will Rogers leaning against the wall, sobbing like a child. He closed the door in a few minutes. Rogers appeared back on the platform uh, with a vibrant uh, attitude and um, performance as just before. And it went on to say this. If you want to learn what a person's really like, ask three questions. What, what makes him laugh? What makes him angry? And what makes him weep? You see, Peter had learned all three of those and he experienced all three of those, probably pretty much like all of us have. These are fairly good tests of character they're especially appropriate for Christian people. I hear people saying we need angry leaders today. Or the time has come to practice militant Christianity. Perhaps, but the wrath of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. That's what Peter has said and that's what Peter's learned. He goes on to say, this is an article actually by Warren Wearsby. He said, what we need today is not anger, but anguish. The kind of anguish that Moses displayed when he broke the two tablets of the law and then climbed the mountain to intercede for his people or that Jesus displayed when he cleansed the temple and wept over the city. The difference between anger and anguish is a broken heart. It's easy to get angry, especially at somebody else's sins. But it's not easy to look at sin, our own sin included, and weep over it. That's why Peter wrote what he wrote. It's very easy, very easy to take these things for granted he's written about. Finally, be of one mind. Have a compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil, railing for railing, but opposite, contrariwise, blessings, knowing that you're there and too called, that you should inherit a blessing. Bottom line is this, guys. We have to be a blessing to get a blessing. And I think that's what Peter's writing in this text. There's somebody, somebody always worse off than we are if we really want to pay attention. Let's all stand tonight. I'm going to ask Danny to come and play for us tonight. Our heads bowed and eyes closed tonight as we think about this scripture. Some of these things will be very easy to go around. But I wonder tonight, maybe God's spoken to you, the Holy Spirit's dealt with you about being courteous. You need to work on being courteous. That's not my job to decide that for you. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. More courteous? Do we need to be more compatible? Do we need to be more compassionate? Do we need to be more caring? Do we need to be more comforting? Are we submissive in our conduct? Those are all things that Peter discusses in the heart of this little chapter. Are we sanctified? Have we been set apart? Are we living sanct set apart in our lifestyle? Is there anything different about us than those others down at the school or down on the job? Do we need to work on getting back on the right path? Are we saintly 
in our character. There's some things that ought to break our heart when we begin to fail in character. And it ought to cause us to fall on our knees before God and say, help me, Lord, to be restored and, and to be replenished, to be revived in the, in the character of my life. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the challenges we find in this scripture. Very, very convicting tonight for every one of us. Lord, we have a great responsibility to one another, to be kind to one another, to be love one another, to see each other through the eyes of Jesus, to be caring, to be compatible, and to carry forth with all these things uh, that Peter writes about. Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts now, Father, and that we'd be obedient now. We wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but we'd be doers. We'd respond to you tonight. If there's areas in our life that we need to repent of, if there's areas in our life that we need to confess and, and we need to grow in, I pray you'd speak to us tonight, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.